presentation is about how we as artists can be more aware of the trauma of the people who were affected by the floods and how when we work with them we can take into account some of the issues that might come up. Thanks Derek. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been with Lifeline 25 years this year so I've been there a long time. Uh, during that time, I've been involved in um, more than 20 natural disasters uh, across our region. And uh, my first experience uh, actually as a young, good-looking, fit 17-year-old was uh, the 1974 flood, so probably giving away my age there. Um, but that's when I actually got first introduced to community recovery. Uh, and since coming to Lifeline, uh, the Queensland Government has Lifeline listed as one of the immediate response organisations to go in after a disaster has occurred and to provide what's known as psychological first aid. So what I'm going to teach you and talk through with you is really about psychological first aid and how you can actually apply it when you're going into businesses that when you start talking about your mosaic um, that if you're starting to see reaction with them and they're starting to relive the, uh, the events uh, of the 10th of January 2011, that you'll be able to know what to do about it. Okay. But what uh, what we're still experiencing even today in Toowoomba is that there's a number of individuals in this community who have still not recovered from the 2011 January floods. Uh, we find some of them are almost what I call locked in the time capsule at the moment, where their businesses have been destroyed, and for one reason or another. They just haven't been able to get out of that out of that doldrum and, and get either the business reopened or make a decision to actually shut the business completely down. And we're trying to work with those uh, some of those people today to to make determinations about what will be their future. What I suspect that will happen for you is that if you're meeting with uh, business owners and you're talking about the mosaic and and talking about um, what, what constitutes the mosaic, then you, you may find that all of a sudden they start to look a bit blank. They may actually start to actually get a bit uh, fidgety. Um, they might say, look, I, I, um, I'm actually not feeling really well at the moment. Um, and what can be going on for them is that reliving what happened on the 10th of January. Now, it would be different, and we were, I was talking to these lovely ladies here before, that. For different businesses, it's going to have different levels of impact. Some people were not severely impacted. They had water damage, but it wasn't major. For other people, they lost their cars. They almost lost their lives. Their businesses were totally wiped out. Though. They weren't able to trade for a long period of time. They had loss of income, a whole range of issues. What, what, what you need to do when psychological first aid teaches you is slow your process down. So just back off a bit with them and say, look, how are you feeling at the moment? Are you okay? Do the check-ins. What's happening for you at the moment? And if they start saying, well, look, I'm actually feeling uncomfortable, I'm starting to think about what happened. And, uh, you know, in the pet shop next door to Lifeline, it's not there now, but uh, there were stories how the lady held the dogs up in the air while the floodwaters came through. So they would be rethinking things possibly about what took place at that time. So sit with them if they're, if they're willing to sit down. Uh, that's what a lot of psychological first aid to let them tell you what's going on for them first up. That's most important. And obviously uh, be, have, have a lot of empathy. Don't, don't be judgmental with them by any means. Not that you would be, but it's just be aware that this empathy is what they're looking for initially. And then you can explore things if you wish about saying, well, who, who have you been discussing your concerns with? You know, have you been talking to your doctor? Have you been talking to your partner? Have you got a good friend? Do you have a best friend? Who, who have you been sharing this? And, and it might come out that they say, look, I'm still not sleeping well. I'm still having kind of recurring nightmares about this. Even 12 months, 18 months on, it's just not settling for me. So then, the, the ideally, you do referral pathways. You look at things saying, well, okay, Look, have you thought about actually contacting agencies like Lifeline, um, Centre Care? Have you thought about going to your doctor? Have you thought about private practitioners, uh, psychologists, about having a talk through? Not, it's not that you're crazy, you're not crazy, 
It's just that there is a form of psychological trauma that has not been resolved for you at this point in time. And you may need to talk that through and help put it to rest. So, I mean, I've gone bang like that fairly quickly and that won't happen as fast as I've told you. But that's where, in some cases, I'm saying you could end up. If they have not, because a lot of people go, you know, we saw this a lot with the floods, particularly down the range around Murphy's Creek. Oh, she's right, you know, floodwaters came through, you know, lost a few chooks, lost the dog. It's all good. You know, let's get the house rebuilt, let's get going. Six months later, when we did the check-ins, I'm not tracking well. You know, I'm now back in the house, and I'm in, but I'm not feeling too good. It's not uncommon. The psychological trauma actually lasts two years after an event, and you'll find that it comes in six-month cycles. So, you know, we're coming up to the anniversary again in January. We can expect that people are going to start to relive those thoughts again. So if you're going and talking with them, you can expect that that will, may well be starting to build at the moment. So think about your referral pathways for them. If they become overwhelmed, I would suggest you pull back and stop right there and say, look, I'll come back another time when, when you may be more up to this at the moment. I can see now that this is quite distressing for you. Don't push me on that point. Okay. So for you going in, is picking up what's the warning signs, looking at how they're reacting to you, asking those gentle questions about, well, what is happening for you at the moment? You seem to be uncomfortable about this. Is it the mosaic? Are you reliving the trauma that happened? Once they, and they, you'll normally find nine out of 10 will tell you straight away. They'll open up about it and say, well, this is how I'm feeling. And then you'll need to make a call, either you sit with them or you recommend a referral and come back in another time. If there are other work colleagues that are with them, ask them if there's a close friend or a work colleague that they're comfortable with and see if they can come over. Ask them if they drink tea or coffee. Give them, a, give them something to help simmer them down or they might even just want a glass of water at that time. So yeah, look for those support measures. Someone who they're comfortable with who can come and sit with them. If you, if you come into that situation as well uh, and you're seeing that they are really quite distressed, the other thing is don't leave them at that point of time. Come, come to some form of agreed arrangement. Are they going to ring their doctor? Are they going to ring their partner to come down and be with them? Is there someone in the workplace? Make sure that before you leave them, there's a plan in place of how you're going to keep them safe. If I take you back to World War II, what, what happened, in, and um, certainly in my era, um, I was told not to ask my father or my uncles or my friends about what happened in the war. You know, they, they don't want to talk about it, so you don't ask about what happened in New Guinea. What we've found out is that that's actually the wrong thing. We should have allowed them to actually talk about what had gone on for them. And, and so it's, it's good that they actually wish to talk about it. And don't be surprised that they do get emotional. I did a presentation about six months ago, and I was heavily involved in the floods here in a whole range of fronts, as Maria knows, from coordinating teams going in at some stage to sit 16 different locations across our region through to opening up our distribution centre one weekend and taking 172 tonnes of donations in two days. And I remember I, I was talking about how you deal with the trauma and I was remembering one of my truck drivers who I could still see in my mind sitting there with the tears just flowing down his face. And I went up and said, Barry, what's the problem? He said, tell them to stop, Derek. I can't do this anymore. I'm just overwhelmed and I can't handle it. And at that point of time, when I was doing the presentation, I actually got, I got myself emotionally wound up about it then. And I was thinking, what's going on for me? Like it was, and, and it was that raw, probably still for me as well, the impact. Because what happens is that when we're doing the recovery, we all often run on our adrenaline. So you sleep very little, you're doing long hours, you're making lots of decisions. And um, yeah, it was, it, yeah, it, it hit me, so it's not uncommon. And I've been doing it for a long time, a long time. Queensland Health have a mental health team that are circulating at the moment. Um, and, and you know, the term mental health is, we all have mental health issues, though. I just want to put that out broadly. You know, we, we have good days and we have bad days. We're human beings, just the way it is. And I think a lot of people go mental health and go, oh, you know, I'm crazy. Well, it's not that at all, it's just that, 
um, you know, that, that's, that's the stress levels sometimes that we work under. I think it's really wonderful that you're actually having discussion about what you, you are encountering and likely to encounter in the process. I think that's very for having a lot of foresight to do that. Because a lot of people say, well, you put the mosaic together, you check out the facts. You know, Maria came down with us. We, we spent about an hour and a half, I think, sitting with the staff and a whole range of new, new uh, issues came out, out of that about events on the day of people sitting in a foot of water reading books, not wondering why their feet were getting cold <laughs> as the floodwaters came through. I mean, that kind of service, I hadn't heard that one before. So, so it does draw out those things, those finer ones. And, and I think everyone here that was there on that day, we all have our own individual stories of what we experienced when we saw those floodwaters going down the streets. And, uh, and certainly below the range. And, you know, I, you know I, I could tell you a lot of stories, and particularly in the southwest. And, and, and one of the things I'll share with you is about in natural disasters that life doesn't stop during a natural disaster. So babies are still born, people still die, you know, people have birthdays, relationships break down, people get married. It's just life goes on and what you've got to do is work around that to get the best results. Um, we, we teach people in suicide prevention and that is that you have to ask the questions. So if someone's not tracking well, it's not about saying, well, look, I don't think they're going too well, but I'm actually not going to ask the question. So I think what you can do with her, so remember last time I was here, you know, we had a bit of a, um, you had a bit of reaction when I was here and was a bit concerned. And we talked about, you know, seeking a bit of help. Have you, did you follow through? How did you go with that? And she'll make it very clear very quickly whether she wants to go down that path or not. And on most times, again, they will say, yeah, I did actually, I did follow up. That was really good. Or no, I've been chewing it over, and that allows you the other opportunity to say, well, you know, look, I was in this workshop the other day, and they were really encouraging for your well-being to be able to get over the hump and move on. That would be good if you had some counselling. And there's lots of free counselling. Lifeline's all free, and they're all professional counsellors there. We can book them in and do it for them. Okay, so ask the question. Don't be afraid. You know, people are afraid sometimes and often what we've found you know and in the suicide area in Canada they did a survey many years ago and they got a group of people who were suicidal and they actually pushed them through their GPs and only one third of the GPs picked up on the warning signs right because they're so busy you know they're processing 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 and these people really wanted to talk about self-harm and about how they were feeling at the time and out of that came a program called Living Works. And Living Works teaches you that you need to be in actual fact, have to ask the hard questions sometimes and say, look, I see you're not tracking well what's going on. It's too late after the event. It's too late after someone's taking their life. You often hear the words, if only, if only I'd asked the question, if only I'd done something. So can I just suggest, don't be afraid to ask. And you can do it nice and politely with respect and they'll give you an answer one way or the other. And I will often say too, um, to my staff, you've got to think before, think here before you speak. Think about what you're going to say, because once you put it out there, you can't pull it back. And, uh, and in, all, in all our lives, there's parts of our lives that we have to say that segment is closed and we have to move on. It just happens. Derek, that's been wonderful.